on to the uh, magic and well-being uh, conversation uh, from the Science of Magic uh, Association. Uh, today, we're going to be having our discussion on uh, magic and well-being with uh, Kevin Spencer, Harrison Provner, uh, Let, uh, Let Lender, and, uh, and, and stepping in for uh, Magicians Without Borders is going to be T Tom Werner, uh, the the founder. So, um, so we're going to start out with uh, our speakers giving a quick introduction. Uh, so, how how about um, uh, uh, Kevin? Would would you like to start? Give a little introduction about yourself. Sure. Um, so my name is Kevin Spencer. I took advantage of the pandemic and relocated from my home in Virginia to Arkansas in the US uh, to be closer to my family. Uh, my wife and I were performers for a number of years, for about 30 years. 20 of those 30 years, we carried the largest theatrical touring illusion show in the US. We retired in 2015 to focus on the work of our nonprofit, which is using magic tricks in a, um, in a therapeutic way, both to kind of focus on academics and on uh, therapeutic objectives for mostly children and adolescents with disabilities. I have done a lot of work with adults, both younger adults with traumatic brain injuries and spinal cord injuries and older adults, mostly stroke, that sort of thing. <clears throat> My focus is particularly on the active benefits, the active therapeutic benefits of using magic in a clinical setting. Uh, I, I'm a research consultant with the University of Alabama at Birmingham and the Institute for Arts and Medicine. And I teach a class on the intersection of the arts and disability at a small private uh, university in Pennsylvania. Awesome, thanks so much for that, Kevin. Uh, I know you've done a, a lot in this space, so really thankful to have you, have you here. And how about uh, uh, Harrison, would you like to uh, tell us a little bit about what you've done? Sure. Thanks, Steve. And thanks, Kevin. Um, so my name is Harrison Proudner. Um, I do most of my work in the magic sphere with uh, Magic Aid, uh, which is a nonprofit that I'm vice president of and research director for. Uh, I'm also a physician, um, a resident physician um, at Yale University. Um, I'd like to say I don't quite consider myself a magician, but I work with Magic Aid where I learn to do some magic. Um, so Magic Aid, just a little bit about that, it's a 501c3 where we bridge magic and medicine. So what does that mean? Um, we connect clinicians, healthcare providers, and, and the like. Uh, we teach them how to do magic so that they can foster communication skills and they can really foster connections with their patients better. Um, our main programs are with medical students where we teach them to do magic from scratch and facilitate them interacting with patients. Um, and help them get into the hospital in an empathic setting using magic. Um, we also do a lot of work where we look into the evidence-based sphere of magic. So that's doing research on magic applications, magic technique, and how they directly relate to the clinical setting. Um, and I focus a lot of my attention on that where I've been directly involved in planning and carrying out a few of those um, studies. Um, so yeah, that's about, about me and, and Magic Aid and what we do. Awesome, thanks so much for that, Harrison. Uh, a big fan of your work myself. And um, next up, uh, uh, we, we have a actual, another uh, practitioner in the healthcare space, uh, Linda Miller. Uh, what, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everybody. Thanks for inviting me, Steve. It's um, great to be here. So um, I'm based in London. I've been a doctor for 30 years. I'm also a medical educator and for the last 13 years I've been a coach for doctors. So I coach doctors about their well-being and flourishing. Um, and I'm really interested in the arts generally and how they support well-being, but particularly of practitioners. Um, in 2017, there was a parliamentary study in the UK which looked at all the arts in health. So whether it's playing Mozart to premature babies or teaching people with Parkinson's to dance, there's a load of evidence out there. 
Um, so I created a series of workshops for doctors um, incorporating all sorts of arts. I um, uh, did sessions on stand-up comedy, cartooning, um, uh, zine making, um, poetry, all sorts of things, and including a session with magic. And uh, just a brief uh, background to what we did in that session. I worked with the magician Tracy Wise, who's amazing. I don't know any magic. <laughs> And basically, we looked at people's magical thinking about their health, um, and particularly doctors' magical thinking about their health. We're not superheroes, we're human, we get ill as well. Um, and this clearly related to contagion and the ideas that people have about contagion. There's some fascinating research on that. Um, and then uh, we went on to follow on from that and Tracy actually taught us some magic tricks. So a little bit like Harrison does, thinking about how we can actually use magic with our patients, as well as a way of switching off <coughs> and relaxing ourselves. Um, so that's basically um, how I got connected with magic and doctor's wellbeing. So. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Linda. Uh, we're really glad to have you here as well. Uh, I, I, a lot in the cl clinical areas, uh, people working with, and and um, last up, uh, Tom Verna. Would, would you like to tell us a bit about uh, Magicians Without Borders? Yeah, thank you so much, Steve, for inviting me. I'm really grateful to be here. I'm Tom Werner, and with my wife, uh, 20 years ago, we founded uh, Magicians Without Borders. And for the past 50 years, and it just seems so bizarre saying 50 years, I've been traveling three different paths um, pretty much at the same time. I've been a clinical psychologist with a private practice and also working uh, in hospitals, specializing in working with dreams. I've been a Jungian trained psychotherapist. Uh, I've also been a professor of psychology, teaching psychology all these years. And that balance of practice and teaching has been really, really important for my personal as well as professional development. It just seems like the two of them call on and help develop very different parts of myself. And I've also been a professional performing and teaching magician um, most of those years. Uh, at one point owning a magic shop um, during when I was writing my PhD dissertation, I owned a magic shop in um, Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, and 20 years ago, those three paths emerged and came together in a wonderful way when we started Magicians Without Borders. Uh, as Carlos Lopez, um, who's our director of global programs this morning, said, our mission is to use the art of magic to entertain, educate, and empower forgotten uh, children around the world. And uh, I needed to be a, both a psychologist, a teacher, and a magician uh, to do our work. We've traveled to uh, 45 countries, mostly war-torn places, and by UN estimates have performed for over, well over now, a million refugee and orphan children. And we also have 10 groups of uh, kids around the world, very poor kids living in difficult, difficult places that we've been training to be magicians for the last 10 years. And that's what we, uh, maybe I can talk a bit more about, about that work um, as our panel goes on. But magic and hope, magic and hope is very much at the heart of um, Magicians Without Borders. And a good friend of Magicians Without Borders, Bob 
Neil, the great philosopher and creator of magic once wrote, if magic is anything, it's a gift of hope. And there's an amazing quote from Harry Houdini that I'll end with. Houdini once said, when I perform my magic for people in difficult situations, and Houdini was a refugee himself fleeing the pogroms in Hungary. He said, when I do my magic for people in difficult situations, it not only amazes and amuses, but it can awaken hope that the impossible is possible. So that's all for right now. And I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Tom. Um, it's, it, I mean, it's really amazing to have all of you guys here together, like, like Harrison and uh, Kevin doing stuff in the clinical and therapeutic aspects with, uh, and, and you, Tom, with, uh, the, with your background in, the, in psychology and everything. So we're really seeing um, a, a pretty broad, broad area of this topic of magic and well-being, whether it's physical well-being or psychological well-being and and more and more generally I, I guess like like from the sciences like part of that psychological well-being is actually how giving back to others like how can we use magic for the greater good so for this panel panelist discussion we're going to explore some of those questions questions a, a bit deeper uh, but to, to start out, uh, I wanted to focus on the clinical aspect and the clinical and therapeutic context. So um, um, maybe uh, Linda, Linda, you'd be a good place to start because you've had a lot of experience uh, practice, as a practicing doctor. So uh, would you mind sharing your thoughts on how magic might be used to promote well-being in clinical and therapeutic contexts and maybe some challenges? For when people uh, try doing this? Yeah, I think um, there are a great deal of similarities between the communication skills that doctors need and those that magicians have. Um, so I teach communication skills to medical students at a couple of universities and we use actors and we do a great deal of work on, on their communication. But I think to be able to build rapport with people really quickly is something that magicians do really well. And that whole trust that they build up as well, because um, people engaging with a magic trick don't want to look silly. So there, there's a great deal of trust that needs to be established. I think I can see Kevin smiling, that's obviously yes. <laughs> ring bells, yeah. Yeah, but, but also clinically, you know, doctors are patients too. Doctors have higher rates of depression, um, drug and alcohol dependence, divorce, and really sadly death by suicide. So I, I really feel passionately that we can use the arts to support doctors as well, so. Magic can really help the provider too, as the, the clinician, the nurse, the child specialist that's doing it, um, really builds not just self-esteem, builds just frank happiness. Um, it's a way that you're in a difficult setting to begin with, with people who are sick, um, which is not a fun environment for anyone. It's not a fun environment for patients and it's not fun from the clinician provider to see, especially in today's world, um, to, see, to see bad things happen. Um, and everyone is in this together and magic is a way to really just make everyone happy. Um, while, it, while Harrison and, and Magic Aid and Linda kind of focus on uh, the clinician, the physician, the, the practitioner, of, of medicine. Um, my focus really is working with occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, and their interactions with their clients and using, using magic actively as a therapeutic intervention. The work that we've done uh, since, I, I think since 2018, we've published um, 10, 10 studies in peer-reviewed journals. Um, nine of those are, are quantitative. One of those is qualitative. Uh, and my, my doctoral thesis is actually qualitative, which seems so bizarre to me because I'm just not a qualitative kind of person. And you would think that I would be since, you know, I'm, 
an artist and, and arts and qualitation or, or qualitative outlooks kind of go together. But anyway, I, I depart. Um, my work really kind of focuses on using magic as a way to help individuals improve five specific areas. So we look at cognition, motor skills, communication, social skills and flexible thinking or creativity. And we look at both the learning of a magic trick and the performance of a magic trick. And we separate those two. The learning of the magic trick attach, you know, goes with those first three elements, the, the cognition, the communication and the motor skills. Those are involved in actually learning how to execute the moves to a magic trick. The social skills and the creativity or the social skills and the flexible thinking align with the performance aspect of a magic trick. And then we bring those two together following some, some pretty common theories. That, uh, for those in occupational therapy, we work off of the model of human occupation, working with uh, volition, habituation, and performance, uh, uh, tap, performance uh, capacity. But we also look at social learning, we look at um, motor learnings, and we look at the incentive theory of motivation. So a lot of different things. I, I think as a magician, I'm absolutely fascinated by the yeah. way all of this kind of comes together, it just kind of blows my mind. Yeah, I can imagine how broad and how many different ways you can go with go with this in all these different areas. Well, and I think just looking at this, the fact that, you know, that some work at the practitioner level, some look work at the client level gives the breadth, the scope of what we can do with that, magic and medicine. And, and, and even in different parts of the, the world, like what uh, Tom does. So um, do you have any uh, fi quick final th thoughts on that, Tom? Uh, well, how, I'm gonna say something I didn't even have any clue that I was going to say, but my um, main teacher, a psychology teacher was the Jungian archetypal psychologist, James Hillman. And he felt really passionate that clinicians, people who are working with people like in psychotherapy, for instance, like myself, or doing even the work with Magicians Without Borders, for sure, that we need some kind of creative activity ourselves, whether that's ballroom dancing, or whether it's writing, or whether it's doing magic, or whatever it is, because that kind of clinical work is really difficult and demanding, and you can really burn out really easily. And that kind of creative activity feeds my soul and keeps me moist and refreshed. And so being able to combine magic and psychology and is just um, feels very important. I was reminded of that when Linda was talking because she was saying how the clinicians get kind of renewed by doing magic. So that's, I have some other thoughts about those other things, but I'll just leave it at that right now. Thanks, Steve. Thanks so much for that. Uh, all of you really. Uh, and, um, and yeah, so like, it seems like that, like there's some value in it, not only for the, you know, the patients, but also for the doctors as well, in terms of burnout. And I, I know the research is still very young, early on in it. Uh, so, uh, so, so happy to see more going on in the future. And now shifting gears a, a little bit from the clinical side where we typically tend to focus more on the sick patient or, or, or people having problems. I wanna flip the conversation a little toward the, the opposite side, which many of you already touched on is like, like, how do you guys think magic could be used to cultivate a, a life of happiness or positive personal growth growth with you? And since I think you started touching on this uh, already, Tom, do you want to uh, continue on that? Uh, I just feel, um, I just say this over and over to um, both my students and, and to myself. I'm constantly amazed that I can have, like in my shoulder bag, a couple of rubber bands, a sponge ball, a couple of stupid little sponge balls, maybe a deck of cards and some coins, all which will fit into a little Ziploc bag. And I can bring so much joy and happiness in so many different situations. Magic, just how it found me 
and gave me this amazing gift um, is, is just um, beyond me. I really feel like it found me and I am so grateful that with these, in a way, silly, silly little props, we can do so much. That's magic, you know, that with these little things, so much joy and happiness, whether it's a patient in a hospital or a friend or a student in a class. Do you, do that? Do, do you think, um, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious, uh, like, do you think there'd be, there's more benefit in, what, in like when you, should, when you perform it and when someone's watching it or, or whether you're learning it, is there more benefit? I'm just curious. I'm not exactly sure what you mean, Steve. I mean, I mean, I mean, like, like you noticed yourself, like how, how meaningful and, and how much impact that had on you, you yourself, in your own personal growth, right? No. So, do, do you think that transfers to like the the others when you when you uh, do your programs for the kids? Well, um, I, I, I'm like. Um, Kevin was just speaking about this. Richard Wiseman was talking about the researchers and the practitioners. I'm a totally qualitative kind of person. I, I'm not a data person. And I'm so thankful there's people out there who do that. Um, but um, I tell stories and that's my, that's my data, you know? And I was just thinking one of the groups that we work with is a group of the daughters of commercial sex workers in the brothels of Mumbai. And we had 12 girls um, who were daughters of commercial, and they grew up in the brothels. I mean, unspeakably, they slept under the beds with their moms working all night on top of them. And there's no surprise that 70% of those kids end up in the sex trade, uh, that's no surprise. And there's an amazing woman, Priti Patkar, who started an organization called Prerna, where she's trying to put an end to sex, a second generation sex trafficking. And we were telling her after a performance we did for some of the kids of the sex workers, about our work in El Salvador and that we trained 12 kids there. She said, could you do that with 12 of our uh, girls? So we did that, we started that. And about three years into that, Mrs. Potkar and I were sitting um, next to each other watching actually the woman now who runs our program in India, Priyanka, who grew up in the brothels and she was performing at a Don Bosco boys high school. And they were giving her a really hard time. I mean, they were heckling her and she just stood there toe to toe and just with so much grace and, and uh, competence and just did her magic show. And Mrs. Potkar leans over to me. And this was like the seal of approval of our work. This is a woman who's worked with really, really difficult situations in the slums of, of Mumbai. She said, when I see Priyanka performing with such poise and dignity, I know she will never end up in the sex trade. And that to me was the power that this magic had given Priyanka and she's become, anyhow, that's the story yeah. that- That's a great, great example. Uh, how it helped uh, up a pump of her own growth and her own dignity and everything. Yeah. Anyone else want to jump in on, uh, on, uh, on the, the on, on the personal growth or, or happiness side of this, Harrison or Kevin, Linda? I'd like to jump in on the question that you kind of asked there when you said, um, is there more joy found in performing it or watching it? Because I think this goes at the heart, right, of what all of us are doing. There's a great amount of joy that comes from watching a magic trick happen. You know, that kind of that curiosity that it taps, what it, 
what it does to us inside, all the questions that it makes us ask. And, and that hopefulness that Tom was talking about, that kind of, that inspiration that it gives to us. But I think as a performer, there's also this, this element of joy. When, when we talk about it, I don't mean from my days of being on the stage. I mean, my days of working with this therapeutically, there's a different kind of joy of satisfaction, of gratification that I feel when I perform a trick and teach a trick to a child or an adolescent or an adult. It's a different kind of feeling. I can honestly say that when my wife and I decided to transition into this work and away from our stage show, um, and I'm gonna try not to get really emotional here, um, it, it was because of the feeling that you get when you perform that trick and teach that trick to somebody and then you watch them successfully perform that trick after they practiced it and they put all that time into creating their story and their performance that moment when that kid says look I did it or as Tom says they stand there and they perform with such dignity and respect I don't, I don't, I have struggled to find words to be able to describe what that experience is. And uh, I do know this, it, there's no applause on any stage anywhere in the world that comes close to the feeling that I have when I see that kid perform that trick and have that glow of confidence and success. It, it's, um, it's really powerful. It's, it's really powerful. Yeah, I, I, can, I can tell from your voice, I think, just how much of an impact it had on you. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, we'll move on to the next questions too, but if, Ooh, if I do- the, Linda had her hand up. I'd love to hear what Linda said. Yeah, please. I was just gonna say, um, uh, similar to the work that Kevin does in the UK, there's the Breathe organization. And I shared with my, fellow doctors a little video that they have online I would encourage anybody to watch it because it just shows exactly what Kevin's describing um, so children with hemiplegia who previously couldn't do up their buttons but have mastered these magic tricks and it's just an absolute joy to watch it really um, can I bounce it, off of that Linda that yeah, sure. I, I have that is such a, a beautiful video that they have on their website I mean I, I can't tell you the number of times I've seen it and I think I cry every single time at the end I think it just makes me cry um, I had the great privilege of working with Dr. Green Dido Green on that project early on and Yvonne Thorson and those those folks wonderful work that they do um, we, we put out in 2015, for anybody that's interested, drop me an email. We produced a short documentary, 22 minutes long, called Powerful Medicine, Simply Magic. And we put it together for clinicians. That's what we were thinking. Um, but then under the um, encouragement of the editor, uh, we decided to submit it to a film festival. And to date, this short 22 minute documentary has earned 18 best short documentary awards at international film festivals, including the International Humanitarian Platinum Award from the United Nations. And it speaks directly to this idea of the, the joy, the success that um, individuals experience through the learning of a magic trick. And part of the footage in that film was, was gifted to me by Breathe by Breathe Arts. So you'll see some amazing young people as a part of that film. Thanks for that, Kevin. And uh, did, did you have any uh, thing you, thoughts you wanted to add, Harrison? Yes, yeah, so I did. Um, back to what Kevin said before about essentially how it's different when you work with a patient and you really see what they got out of it. The, just seeing a smile, walking into a room that is gloomy, that is unhappy, that is, Nobody wants to be in this setting and leaving with a smile and having a parent say that the first, that's like the first time they saw their child smile in days. It, it really does make a big impact on, on you doing the magic. Um, and it also helps you look at perspectives, right? As magic, you have to pay attention to yourself, how you present yourself, but you also have to know how you're perceived by others, right? You have to think about perspective, which as a clinician, is incredibly important. Um, 
that's how bedside manner, for instance, is the term that's used, right? How do you come off as a person? How do you come off in your communication? Um, and really understanding the perspective of your patients is something that magic, I think, really fosters. Mm. Oh, thank, yeah, thanks so much for that, Harrison, as well. And uh, yeah, so I think we'll move on to the last question, which I think we're, we're just naturally getting there. Uh, but more generally, how can magic be used for the greater good? Anyone want to start with that? Okay. Linda, Harrison, do you have any thoughts on that? I'll sure. go. I'm, I'm happy okay. to go. Um, I, I think we've touched, you know, Tom's work in Mumbai, there's, we've already heard loads of examples, haven't we? But um, I think the real issue in healthcare is, in terms of sustainability, is recruitment and retention of the workforce. So in the UK, we're 4,000 GPs short, even before the pandemic, and we've tragically lost so many colleagues. Um, and in the NHS, the National Health Service, uh, there are 10 million sick days lost in terms of staff health, and that costs 2.4 billion a year. So there are, you know, huge economic um, imperatives to do more to support healthcare practitioners. So I think, you know, in terms of the, the global scale, and that's global, that's not just in the UK. So I think there's huge potential there. Awesome. And um, um, maybe Tom, you, you wanna go next? Well, I, th I think I'd um, uh, like to sort of say what I said earlier, but maybe broaden it a bit that maybe this idea of, and you're gonna have this topic uh, next month that you're gonna spend you know, the day exploring is, is it's, it's creativity seems to be so so important and um, and it doesn't have to be magic i mean magic for me is a wonderful one and for people some people at the gathering today but whatever it is i think us spreading the idea that especially and not only um, people who are doing healthcare, whatever it is, physical or emotional or spiritual, whatever kind of care it is, um, needs their own practice, um, their creative practice to keep them nourished. And um, I think if we could spread that idea, um, that would help the general good very much so. Because I think people, People, everyone needs that. What what I know, I get from from magic. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So creativity seems to be pretty important, which which the the next Soma seminar is going to be on as well. Um, uh, uh, Kevin or Harrison, you, you want to share your thoughts on how it can be used for the greater good? Yeah, so I'll go ahead. Um, first of all, yes, I totally agree with everything that um, Linda and Tom mentioned. Um, magic, I feel like, is one of those things that's universal, right? You don't need you don't need to speak. You don't need to speak the same language. You don't need to look the same way. You don't need to have the same background. You make something, even just sleight of hand, disappear, and you'll everyone will smile, right? So it's a way, like I was talking about in the last segment about perspective and understanding and seeing we are all humans and understanding what humanity is. I think magic has the potential to do, to do that um, more so on the, the more personal basis, right? So doing magic in small groups, doing magic one-on-one, -on -one, using magic in workshops like, like Linda was talking about. Um, it's a way to build connections between people who normally wouldn't. Um, and I feel like that's something that we can really bridge a lot of a lot of different people with. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks so much for that. And uh, Kevin, you have any final thoughts on this? No, I would just I would just echo what everybody yeah. else has said. I, I I do think that 
magic has this universal appeal, as Harrison was saying. I think the arts in general are, we have so much evidence that the arts supports emotional well being, that it, 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 it builds community, it, you know, all of those things that we, that we recognize that the arts do. And I think magic is one of those. And it doesn't matter where you're, for instance, we all know that magic is the oldest of all the performing arts. We, we can trace its roots back to Egypt and even before that to the Middle East. I think the oldest record we maybe, have of magic Maybe you want to like, talk a little bit about that, Kevin? Uh, like, 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 like it shares a lot with other arts, um, but what, what aspects or features of magic distinguish it from other arts? That's a, wow, that's a really good question. So I do think a good magician <laughs> has yeah. a very multidisciplinary approach to magic because right. it can't be simply the execution of the moves. It has to be more than that. And I would venture to say that all of us have seen somebody who is an excellent executor of movement, but is not a very good entertainer or doesn't really capture the attention of their, of their audience very well. And this is why I think I'm so fascinated with the work that Linda does, because it is so much more. It's about building that rapport. And I see Harrison nodding, nodding his head. It's about building that rapport and building that trust. And as a performer, you have to do that in the first 30 seconds that you walk on the stage. We used to end our show with an underwater escape. And our whole thing was, if they don't like me, they don't care if I drown. So <laughs> at the very beginning of the show, you have to come out and you have to establish this, this rapport with them. So a good magician builds in those items of, dance and movement doesn't mean you're a dancer i remember so i'm going to reminisce for just a moment my mentor was a magician named doug henning and doug gave me three pieces of really wonderful advice the first advice he said was take acting lessons not because i you're an I ever want to see you scripting or acting on the stage, but in order for your audience to feel comfortable with you, you need to be comfortable on the stage. The second thing he said was take dancing lessons, not because God forbid I should ever want to see you dance on a stage, but you need to be comfortable in your movements and confidence in your movements, because if you're confident, the audience will feel comfortable with you. And then the last thing he said was always be yourself because the audience knows when somebody is a fake. And if they think you're faking it, they're not going to connect with you. And I think all of those things are so appropriate to the conversation we're having right now, especially the last one about being true to who you are and letting your performance do that. So magic brings all of those elements together. And I think the one thing that really separates it, Steve, is the level of curiosity that it taps inside of each and every one of us. And curiosity is a powerful motivator, whether it's an active or a passive sort of approach. Yeah. Motivation, curiosity is such a powerful motivator. Sure. I, thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, so I think we're going to move on to some of the uh, Q&A from the audience member. Um, let, let's start with, um, uh, I guess, might be somewhat related to curiosity, but we've got this uh, question from Marianne Campbell, who uh, actually uh, is involved in, the, in uh, the, this, this project that David Copperfield worked on called Project Magic. And, and I, I just wanna highlight like some of the historical uh, importance of this because I know, I know that this was one of the, one of the very first, first programs that used magic in a, in a therapeutic, therapeutic sense and I know there's a book published uh, about it with tricks and some of the benefits it, it has in a like psychological, social, and physical physical health. And um, and her her question is relates to the the access to to being able to do these programs during the past year with uh, COVID and the I mean and now with the recent Delta, Delta surges. Um, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, it, it, see, I'm reading her question. It sounds like that, like there's uh, some challenges with uh, it being more like a drive-by th therapy thing instead of having the actual time to 
come in and, and work with the, the patients and to, to have the effect. So do you, what are your guys' uh, findings on how to do that more effectively or successfully in, in these times? Something that um, Magicians Without Borders did in response to the pandemic was um, our kids in Bogota, Colombia, Carlos and I uh, helped them create a virtual magic show. And their parents were all out of work. And Carlos, who's just really brilliant uh, as a promoter and developer, sold this magic show to numerous uh, big corporations. And one of the very first shows that our kids did, these are kids, as you saw earlier, who live in Paradiso, who live in paradise, which is such a strange name for the neighborhood they live in. Um, but the, in their little hovel of a house with a backdrop that we helped them build and their phone, uh, they the first show, one of the first shows was for a big three-day Google Summit in Singapore. Uh, and they were the last performers at this summit, the last bit of entertainment, which was such an amazing blessing because all the heads of the major Google um, teams around the world were at that summit. So they kids ended up doing 32 shows for Google alone. And Google was paying them fantastic money to do this. And we couldn't give all the money to them uh, because it just would have blown their circuits. But we created a scholarship fund for them with the excess money and we gave them what they needed to support sometimes 10 people in their families. And they're still doing that. And that's one kind of pivot that we were able to do during the pandemic, which is 98% of that is Carlos Lopez's um, ability and, and work. Uh, so yeah. if you're I've listening, spoken. Carlos, you know, I've told you yeah. that. Times. <laughs> yeah, he, I've spoken to Carlos many times. He's he, he does amazing amazing work. Yeah, and um, I'm actually curious to hear a little bit more of of Harrison's per, uh, like like how, how you pivoted during during these these times. And I mean, because I mean, a, a lot of times, like the answer is like like oh, like oh, we switched virtually. But I want to get a little more specific on the, the how, like how did you leverage your resources to do that effectively? Because some, sometimes you can host a virtual event and no, no one shows up. So. Great, thanks, Steve. And I have to say, yes, um, definitely virtual has, has been the, the response, but it's hard, right? A lot of magic is, at least what we do in Magicate is every single interaction we have with the child, they are touching some prop that we have they are learning to do some of the magic and we're leaving them with a prop, which is almost impossible to do virtual based on what we do. Also, we work with um, mostly students and clinicians who are not magicians. So you can't really adapt the magic too much, right? We have our, our set curriculum, we have basic tricks that we teach and some of that can be done virtual um, and not all. Um, so we did a few things. Um, one was, yes, we did virtual. Um, we did some of our Magic Aid live events that Justin Willman did, where we were one-on-one -on -one with patients virtually. Um, some of our chapters, different institutions did one-on-one -on -one magic virtually too. But we also have a bunch of centers, since our students are directly affiliated with medicine and are directly affiliated with the hospitals, a lot of the hospitals are allowing them to actually go in. Um, so they're going in with full PPE, with a face mask, with a shield, with with everything they need to, to be safe for themselves and for the patients and still doing hands-on magic. Um, so we focused our attention on training our, our students who are new to medicine, who don't necessarily know a lot of these infectious protocols, training them how to do these methods safely, how to, what items can be sterilized, what items cannot. For instance, sponge balls, you use it with one patient, there's no way you're cleaning that. You have to, you cannot reuse that. 
Um, so teaching things like that versus other plastic items, other props, you can easily clean or you can open a new one and then clean it at the end of your magic rounds, which is what we call it. So focused on education about infectious disease, um, focus on talking with the institutions that we're at about what our protocols are and how we're being safe, um, but also integrating some of the virtual components um, is how we've, how we've kind awesome. of changed during the pandemic. Yeah, th thanks so much for that the very valuable uh, feedback that I, that, that I hope is helpful for, uh, the, for everyone listening. And I mean, and, and I know uh, that, that, that you guys are open to uh, helping out more generally. So like if anyone wants to reach out to it and, and ask, ask more to, about Magic Aid, you can go to the Magic Aid website to do that. And which it, I, I think it's just magicaid.org, right? Yes, it's magic-aid.org. Uh, feel free to reach out to us through the, through the contact tab over there. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, anyone else uh, have something to add on, on, on how they pivoted through this? Uh, yeah, Linda. I was just thinking about um, what Harrison was saying earlier about um, equality and diversity that, you know, magic transverses language barriers, doesn't it? But interestingly, I found that doing workshops online had unexpected advantages for some people um, for example, somebody that couldn't speak because of their um, ICU experience really engaged with the session in the chat. Uh, you know, and I, I'd never foreseen that that could be an advantage of a, you know, compared to a face-to-face -face workshop. So I, it's been a really interesting year in, in, you know, changing to the virtual world, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Right. Thanks for that, Linda. One question that I saw that I think would is re really useful, and I, and like personally, when I every time I well not every time, but a lot of the times when I talk to the people doing doing magic and therapy, they have a similar concern, and that's about the 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 financial challenges of doing this. So uh, Braden Daniels uh, was asking. Uh, are there any grants that help fund this type of clinical use of magic, or is it mostly donation-based funding? And I guess more generally, like, like how do you guys manage to 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 fund this and, and make a successful career out of it at the same time? Um, maybe Kevin, uh, you want to speak to this? Um, sure. <laughs> So I think ours, our organization is funded a lot of different ways. Um, my wife and I were successful as performers. So obviously we funnel some money into our nonprofit personally. Um, the work that I do to the State Department is funded through various embassies around the country, around the world. So I, you know, I have a project in Russia that's funded through the U.S. Embassy in Moscow and one in Turkey that's funded through the embassy in Ankara. And, you know, those sorts of things. We're getting ready to launch a program with the pediatric oncology program at a new hospital in Alexandria, Egypt. And that's also a partnership between the embassy in Cairo and a private organization in Alexandria. Um, I, I think there are ways that you can manage the financial aspects of it kind of marrying the last two things together. One of the things that we had to do when we shifted to virtual was create a, an entirely new sort of approach around everyday magic. You know, I, I did a series of 20 weeks of therapeutic magic with um, 15 kids out of the UK uh, through that, were, that came out of a theater, through Waterman's Theater, through a program called Short Breaks. So, Every Monday, I met with these guys virtually for 20 weeks. Well, I'm not sending magic props, props to, to London, right? And, and with the lockdowns, they're also not going out to get magic props and trying to find them. So we had to create an entirely new program of magic tricks that you can do with items around the house. And so we would create that protocol and send that to them in advance so they would know these are the items I need for today. And then we'd had to sit down and figure out what those therapeutic goals and objectives are that we wanted to accomplish with that. 
So it caused us to think outside of the box a little bit, but it also made it more affordable and it brought people in, like Linda was saying, that could engage with us in the chat. I remember for the first three weeks, I had these two brothers who were on the autism spectrum, and I never saw them on camera for the first three weeks. It was like their camera was off the entire time. And when they would come on to show me the trick, all I saw was this. And then the camera would go dark. So we made it into a game with them because they were totally into lights, camera, action. And that's the way we did it. We were like, okay, get ready, lights, camera. And they would turn their camera on, action. And they would perform and we'd go cut. And then they they cut their camera off. So I, I found different ways to be creative, to make it more in, affordable. And at the same time, make it more accessible. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, Kevin, did those Two autistic spectrum kids ever show up with their face or did it remain with their hands only? At three weeks, I started to see the side of their heads a little bit. Uh -huh. By the time we got to the fifth week, they were actually performing on camera and then disappearing and coming back. And at the end, at the end of this, we did a virtual magic show where all of the all of the, the participants um, got together and did magic uh, live. We did it through a Facebook feed and a Zoom feed. And uh, both of those boys appeared on camera. And, and then afterwards, they sent me this amazing video of them performing all of their tricks for me, complete with their story. So yeah, it was, it was quite, um, it was interesting to watch their progression over those 20, over those 20 weeks. Uh, yeah, it was, it's pretty amazing. That's such Goes back a to that thing about the, the gratification, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, such a great example how magic, who knows? You know, this is the quality quantity thing, but who knows how much them learning magic and getting more confident made them more confident to show their faces and not just their hands and kind of deal with that autism you know that's a beautiful story kevin thank you their mother is a medical doctor and so uh -huh. she was really pretty um adamant about wanting them to be involved and then hearing her from her at the very end of the 20 weeks and kind of hearing her clinical very clinical sort of perspective of, yeah. about what had happened was really cool i meet i meet every week with a very autistic boy named Ezra. And it started during a magic show I was doing a couple of New Year's Eves ago. And he was sitting on the floor up front and he just had this wonderful quirky little presence about him. And so I asked him to come up onto stage. He was just delightful. I just loved him. He was so weird and wonderful and um, and then so much so I brought him up for my very last trick because I wanted to go out with that energy that he put out. About three weeks later, his mother called me and said, um, hi, this is, you may not remember this, but you brought a boy up during your first night show in Bristol. And I, I said, are you kidding? Do I remember that? And she said, he'd love to learn magic. And I said, oh, my God. And so we've been meeting and it's just now we're doing shows together. You know, he'll come with me when I do a show when it's appropriate and do two or three tricks. And he has just emerged like this caterpillar. Like, <laughs> just it's amazing. Uh, I and think a a lot of my work is focused around autism. Great. I would say that the two yes. groups that I work with the most are autism and trauma. And, um, and, and I think there's so much, a lot of my research has been centered around the, ben yeah. the benefits of using magic with kids on the autism spectrum. Yeah. And that socialization, that ability to have a beginning, a middle and an end to a conversation, to be able to be excited about interacting with somebody in a really positive way, as opposed yeah. to some of the negative social interactions that they might have. That's a beautiful story, Tom. That's awesome. When Makes I, my heart smile. Kevin, when I asked him, you know, 
why are you now comfortable, you know, performing? And he talked like some medieval ritual magician. He said, you know, when I'm up on stage, there's like this circle around me, like the medieval magicians talked about drawing a magic circle around yourself. And inside of that, you could do stuff you couldn't do outside of it. He said, I'm protected when I'm on stage. <laughs> it was like so wild. Well, anyhow. And amazing stories, uh, guys. And and I, I know, um, uh, without getting uh, too sidetracked, uh, I just want to get back, because I know uh, magicians with borders, like they've been around for De decade you said 50 years was it well, no no i've been around um uh, 20 years 20, 20 years 20 years sorry about that. 2001 i mean i mean so how what, what were your uh experiences in terms of like funding and keeping it going over the years um and, and how well, you guys we're, we're totally supported by individual donations you know and our biggest donations maybe come from a family foundation, but uh, th there's still uh, basically individual donations and we've right. developed, you know, a base of, of donor support and there. I mean, if it's okay, okay. Uh, what would you mind sharing how you, how that relationship started with the uh, fa bigger family donation? I'm not sure. What do you mean? You mean, no, you said, I, I just mean that some of our donations come oh, from individuals okay. who have a family foundation. But oh, okay. the, the way we started was um, I, I through an amazing synchronistic constellation of circumstances in 2001 in the fall, just a, a number of weeks after 9-11, I found myself in the refugee camps in Kosovo on my way to a meeting in okay. Poland. And there was a little girl in the very first um, uh, refugee camp in a Roma camp, her name was Fatima, and she was six years old and they uh, designated her my guide that day. And she didn't speak a word of English. I didn't speak a word of Roma or, Serbo-Croatian, but she was my guide. And so at the end of the day, I was saying goodbye to these Roma women and um, Fatima was standing beside me and I said goodbye to them and I turned and Fatima was gone. And I went, I said, where's Fatima? And they said, isn't she with you? And I said, no. So I said, say goodbye to her for me. I felt badly. I went over to the car. There was Fatima laying on the floor in the back of the car, hiding, wanting to run away with the magician. And that was when I thought of that quote from, from Harry Houdini, that magic not only amazes and amuses, but it awakens hope that the impossible is possible. And Fatima thought she could escape from, from Momen Potok, that refugee camp. Um, I took a picture of her and told that story. And I sent that letter out to friends and family. And Fatima really raised $20,000 from that first letter. And um, when we went, we went back to Kosovo and found Fatima and went to the head of the refugee camp because we wanted to give her 10% of what we raised. So we had $2,000, which is a fortune in a refugee camp. We went to the head of the refugee camp, a man from the UN High Commission for, and we said, could we give this money to Fatima's mom who had three or four other children? He said, you could not give it to a better person. She will buy them clothes. Fatima had a pair of shoes about size 10 uh, from the garbage dump. She'll buy her new shoes and clothes, send them to school. So that's launched our fundraising. So that's- uh, Thank you. That's, that's a fundraising that's, story. <laughs> I mean, I, I can see why, why it gets people excited enough and you know, it's, it, I mean, sharing those types of stories, it seemed like they really have that impact on, like on the donors, donors, which, which it ends up 
ends up ra raising some money. Two and, powerful uh, things, magic and doing yeah. it for children around the world. It doesn't get... <laughs> is, it, has that been uh, similar in your experience, Harrison, with uh, like, like a lot of donations based with uh, Magic Aid? Right, so we're a little newer than um, Doctors Without Borders, um, but we actually got our support similar ways. Um, it's through personal donations, through family foundations, um, and the, the connections with the different family foundations that we've worked with are either through patients that we've worked with, um, it's a couple of the foundations, or um, just people have heard of us through news sources and the like. Um, we have not yet applied for grants, um, but we're looking at that in more in terms of our research, not so much in terms of supporting the magic programs itself. Um, but it's mostly personal donations. We're also on Amazon Smile. Um, everyone feel free to support us on Amazon Smile. That's where Amazon gives a very small percentage of what they um, sell on their website to nonprofit organizations. I don't know what the exact percentage is, but um, it's a little bit, but it helps. Um, so it's through little things like that, how we really support our operations. And again, where all of us are volunteers. So nobody in our organization really gets paid. Um, so everything that we get goes towards these props. We do also have a few magic suppliers that donate props to us, um, which we can then pass along to patients um, and the like. Awesome, thanks so much. So, so that, that right there is another uh, quick, quick, quick uh, tip. Uh, get your charity registered on, uh, uh, what is it, Amazon Smile? Smile. Yeah, Smile.amazon.com. Yeah, and then, I mean, and then with your network that you have, uh, to remind them of that, and then uh, whatever they're spending on Amazon get, get, would get a, a portion, portion donated to your charity. Like a lot of this work seems to be done with, um, uh, yet younger children. Are you guys, um, do you guys have any experience doing it for older popu populations? Uh, uh, and we're in, we're with psychiatric patients. Yeah, so I can start talking about that. Um, so we started with pediatric patients. It seems like the classic, the classic population to target with magic. Um, all kids love magic. But soon you realize that all parents love magic. And since all parents love magic, all adults like magic and you take it from there. So in Magic Aid, we started with kids, and then we actually branched out to geriatrics. Um, so the older adult population, and it was received almost as well as it was with the pediatric population. Um, so that was our first kind of divergence from, from pediatrics and, and childhood. Um, but now we do with everyone. Um, our medical students are primarily focused with kids just because organizational wise, um, the pediatric parts of the hospital have those child life specialists and different people who are around that can help facilitate some of these interactions that adults don't necessarily have as much of. Um, but we've done a lot with geriatrics and the general adult population too. I think geriatric patients uh, or older people in general are one of my favorite uh, audiences. I, I just think they still... Uh, it, it helps them kind of get in touch with that child that starts emerging, I think, more and more sometimes as people get older. We do have a program that we're beginning another chapter of in um, the next few months, and it's called Warrior Wizards. And um, myself and our vice president, Alex Posner, did a tour of a bunch of VA hospitals. And we were just very touched by the responses uh, from the vets um, in, in the hospital. And we thought this would be so much better if it was being done by a disabled American vet who was trained to be a magician. So we started doing that. I got a group of vets here at the uh, White River Junction Veterans Hospital and trained them and they started performing in the hospital, at deployment parties, at holiday events for vets and their families. And now the man who started our program in Colombia on a Fulbright um, fellowship, uh, Ryan Bart is now in Annapolis. He's in the military having finished his medical training and his residency is now doing one more little training there. And he's gonna start 
with um, a group of vets there. So that's one program that we have for sure that yeah, deals with veterans. Yeah. Actually, like I have like one of my some of my contacts in New Jersey, they, they also regularly do it in VA hospitals as well. So I, I happy to put you in touch with them. Oh, I'd um, love that. That would be great. So okay, so so yeah, I think um that that's about it for time, but um it, the, there's uh, a lot more to be that we can talk about uh, next uh, the, the next uh, ser series of the Sci Science and Magic Association will be on cre creativity, which we've talked about. But like that, uh, thank you so much for to all the speakers, to, to Tom, to Kevin, Harrison, and Linda, and it's and it's great to have you have you here.